All right, uh, we will get started. We have a full meeting today. Thank you. Oops, I'm sorry. All right. John Conier, can you do a sound check for me on the WebEx, please? Hi, Nicole. I can hear you just fine. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. We will get started then. Uh, good morning. I'll call the Tuesday, uh, October 12, 2021, Urban Hill City Council meeting to order and ask Nicole to take roll call, please. Carberry Montgomery? Here. Caduce? Here. Obrecht? Here. Hoagie? Here. Russell? Here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, item two is approve the agenda. That's for a motion and a second. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Obrecht, second by Carberry Montgomery. Discussion, roll call. Obrecht? Yes. Carberry Montgomery? Yes. Hoagie? Yes. Russell? Yes. Caduce? Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. That passes. All right, uh, we do have a full agenda today, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, item three is uh, to, to begin. The item 3.1 of the Central Iowa Economic Development District. And Curtis, I'll turn it over to you to introduce it. Sounds good. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Several months ago, the Metropolitan Planning uh, Organization, the Des Moines Area MPO, asked uh, economic development practitioners across Central Iowa uh, to uh, be a part of a steering committee to help form an economic development district. Uh, the city council, uh, this body, uh, approved me as one of the members of that uh, steering committee and founding board of the economic development district. And this morning, uh, Gunnar Olson and Andrew Collings from the MPO are here to rewind the tape a little bit, uh, go back to what the economic development district is and where it's at now and what the future looks like. So with the schedule in mind and without further ado, we'll turn it over to Gunnar Olson. Mayor and Council, thank you very much for having us today. I do thank you. I do want to send brief greetings and thanks from our director, Todd Ashby. Um, let's get right into it. We have a few things prepared for you today. Uh, Mayor Endewig, who serves on our uh, board at the MPO, will have heard a lot of these things before. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to go through some background of what it is. We're going to do an update on where we are in the process. Uh, we're also going to look ahead at what the next steps are. We're going to address several frequently asked questions, and then I'll open up the table and we'll see if there's any questions that I can try to answer for you. So background, what is this? Why should we care about it? Uh, Central Iowa, or mid-Iowa as we've been calling it, is the only region in the state that does not have an economic development district. It is now uniquely qualified to have one, and that is due to the National Emergency Declaration for the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is the first time that the region would have qualified since 2008. Other regions like Indianapolis and St. Louis are likewise exploring EDD designations at this time uh, because they do see it as a value. What is it? It's twofold. The first thing I want you to think about as a designation. There's a designation from the EDA uh, given to regions that have experienced economic distress. And the other thing that you can think of it as a uh, entity, the EDD organization, uh, which is a multi-jurisdictional, commonly uh, formed of multiple jurisdictions with over a seven, several counties uh, region. Um, and these provide support for the jurisdictions within. A couple of notes on what it is not. It is not a chamber of commerce or like the partnership. Uh, it is not in the business of recruiting businesses, um, not like the economic development offices in your offices. Um, it is not a council of governments. Uh, it is an economic, an EDD can be a standalone entity and really it is a support organization for members uh, like Urbandale would be. There are several benefits to it. The first is a regional plan. Uh, this has been developed as a comprehensive economic development strategy showing region go vision, goals, objectives. And the real support here is that having it listed shows it as a regional priority and gives you a leg up for funding applications. Speaking of funding, um, there are the EDA, excuse me, the EDDs are often first in line for funding through disaster declarations. So, for example, the CARES Act. Um, our region missed out on $470,000 of no match funding that could have been spent for disaster recovery. Uh, likewise, there is an annual funding to help administer it. This is basically staffing costs. There is a local match uh, to that. We'll come back to that point. Um, the funding, uh, and this really brings us to our third benefit, which is staff support. Having that staff person who can act as a liaison between the jurisdictions of the region and the Denver office of the EDA. 
Uh, we'll talk about this point in a little bit, but there are 89 cities and seven counties within this geographic region, and it's almost impossible for the EVA staff to have a relationship with all of those jurisdictions. But if they have fo local folks on the ground who can serve as that liaison, that ends up being a good uh, service to the region. Um, funding examples, I'll leave this on the screen here. I'm not gonna speak to this at length. Uh, you can see, though, the types of projects that are being uh, funded, um, and I will point out that per capita spending was six times higher outside of this region over the period mentioned here, which is January to January 18 to 21. This is a little bit of a unique period given that there's a lot of stimulus money uh, flowing through here. That's not how much you would typically see in a three-year period. So where are we at in the process? Um, this shows the overall approach the first step was to weigh support. Is there support for it? And the second step was then to create the entity and everything that it could entail. And that's about where we're at right now. We've just entered phase three, which is we've submitted our designation application and, and now they're considering giving us that EDD designation. You really have to create the egg before you become the chicken in this scenario. And then finally, we should be into fully operational um, as early as, at this point, I would wager early next year. I did want to make a few notes on progress made to date. We did get unanimous, unanimous resolutions of support passed by all seven counties. That was a required step for, uh, before we could even submit designation or they would consider it. We also received state concurrence from Governor Reynolds um, saying one, that they support the ADD designation request and two, that the, the vision in our SEDS is aligned with the state vision for economic development and resilience. Uh, so thanks to the IEDA staff for facilitating that request as well as to the partnership for helping open those doors. Uh, they've been good partners with this process. We did form a legal entity um, at the recommendation of legal counsel. We formed it as a 504 nonprofit that does meet uh, EDA's requirements. This was much simpler than trying to form a 2080. Um, it also allows jurisdictions to easily join at any time rather than a 2080. Everyone has to agree at the front end. Um, and all of this process was done on an expedited timeline uh, because our whole goal was to put us in a position to start receiving federal money as soon as possible. And one of the questions I've got is, is there a window or a deadline that we have to meet? And we are well within any deadline. We're not at risk of losing out. Uh, should note, name given to the new entity is Mid-Iowa Planning Alliance for Community Development, or MIPA. Lastly, we did develop a comprehensive economic development strategy, which is approved in September by our temporary board. Thank you, Curtis. Um, it did follow a 30-day comment period, and I will note that it's already showing benefits to the region. I know Iowa State, for example, is working on an EDA application, and this gives them a box that they can check rather than having to go through a whole bunch of work on the grant application that says, yes, this is part of the vision. And we have a, a website where you can find all this, midiowaplanningalliance.com, pretty easy to find. So looking ahead, what are the next steps? Um, we are in the hurry up and wait phase. We have submitted, we have done all the designation process, uh, pulled all those documents in, submitted it. Um, and just recently we have received feedback from the EDA on the designation application itself, as well as on the SEDS. So we're in the process of making some updates to those. Uh, we'll bring those back to our interim board for a retroactive approval. Um, and it is also during this period that we're having more conversations like the one we're having today where we're introducing jurisdictions like yours to the concept, making sure you're aware of it, uh, and hopefully are prepared for an ask later on for match money in order to create the, the entity. So frequently asked questions, I'll go through these rather quickly. Um, a lot of people ask, what is the relationship between MPO and MIPA? These will be separate organizations, different boards, dues, bylaws, et cetera. Uh, there will, however, be a contractual relationship. We see MIPA as hiring MPO to administer the entity as needed. Uh, this is a very similar arrangement to what the MPO has with the Central Iowa Regional Transportation Alliance. It basically does transportation planning for the ring around the metro. What will this cost? Um, there is a partnership program that the EDA offers, um, and that program is, uh, offers up to $70,000 annually if matched by $70,000 locally. Um, that $140,000 would cover costs uh, for staffing is effectively what it does. Um, 
I think the real question that you're probably wondering is how much is this going to cost my jurisdiction? And the first thing to note is that there is no cost if you don't want to join. You're not going to be forced in this decision. We hope that you come and join uh, the organization because you see that as a value add to your own operations. Um, but there's no deadline to join. It's up to you whether you join. And we put just some projections on here on what that would cost based on various populations. From most of the feedback that we've gotten so far, Everyone's saying, why wouldn't we for the price? I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna put value statements in your mouth here, but that's predominantly what we're hearing is for the price, this is a no-brainer. Um, so our approach to those fees is, we're kind of at the mercy of the EDA as to when we actually can start qualifying for this, because uh, we have to get that designation before we can apply for the partnership, before we can be receiving those funds. Uh, so we're making an assumption on year one as a partial year, uh, and we're putting our, by year one, I'm talking about a fiscal year that would, mar that would marry or that would match your own fiscal year. And we're saying 7.5 7 cents per person. And that's based on a full cost of annual cost of 15 cents per person. This is assuming that roughly half of the regions participation, participate. And that's a uh, per person or populous uh, type uh, fee. Um, and so we're saying that year one, seven and a half cents, year two, 15 cents. Uh, and then by year three, we'll have a board in place. We'll have a solid understanding of what membership will look like. And then it'll be up to the board where to adjust. Do we need to raise it? Do we need to lower it? We predict probably it would be lowered or you could potentially keep it at that rate, but that's gonna be a future board decision. Uh, but for the first couple of years, you're looking at about 15 cents per person for the whole year. Uh, when will the board be formed? As mentioned, a temporary board of directors has been used to establish the legal entity, and they're serving as kind of a, a leadership to bridge the organization to the full leadership's EDD status. Uh, once we really have it formed with members, fees, all that good stuff sorted out, uh, then membership will be determined. There will be a board of directors for the big decisions, an executive committee to help with day-to-day -day operations. I'm not going to go too deep into this, um, but just the one thing I want to point out is that the... Um, we are one rep per member. So we have as many as 89 different cities, seven uh, counties. So it ends up being a very big board, which is why the executive committee becomes an important function for it to actually operate in a meaningful way. Um, will the board of directors grant or control grant spending? This is a question we've gotten a lot in a lot of different ways. We had a lot of different discussions about, you know, who are the big political animals who are gonna be in the room controlling spending? And that's really, I think, a, uh, an under, a misunderstanding of what and how this organization operates. Uh, at the MPO, as you all know, it is a political process. That funding comes into the region, and then it is a local decision or a regional decision how those funds get reallocated. That is not the case with the EDA. With the EDA, uh, the organization, the EDD organization, is a facilitator between local jurisdictions and funding agencies. And there's no intermediate political decision that says, Irmdale, you can or cannot go for this grant application. It's entirely up to you whether or not you go to grant application. And as far as EDD staff is concerned, is if you're going to go for it, we're, we'll be here to help. What about a project list? This was something we've talked about. Um, we will be adding projects to the SEDS, or our Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, and what that will give you as a entity seeking funding is it just shows this fits the regional goals uh, established by the region and it should give you a leg up in applications. Um, we'll be collecting those later. Uh, if you, you don't have to have a project in, in the list in order to go for it. Um, yeah, that was what's going there. That was it from me. Uh, at this point, I'll happily answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you, Gunnar. Any questions for Gunnar from the council? I guess in the application, it seems like it was a county-based application system, but now then the board and ongoing is going to be kind of going the next layer down of all the cities. Was it kind of debated at one time, or did we just make the board county and have the counties pay for this potentially versus inviting all the municipalities and cities? I'll address that in a couple of different ways. First off, in terms of uh, designation eligibility, it was a federal requirement to have resolutions of support from the county entities. And our ask of them was to allow this to proceed. And in almost, I would say in most cases, the answer that we got was, we're not gonna stand in the way of this. We do, however, wanna make it available because the people who are going to use the most 
are the cities. Typically, the economic development projects that are funded through the EDA tend to fall in the cities. It's not to say counties aren't eligible. They are, and we hope to have some membership from them. But it's the cities that really are going to benefit the most from it. And so we had a lot of conversations with cities who then had conversations with the counties saying, please don't stand in the way of this. Um, and I think that's a big reason why there is unanimous support for it. That being said, there are different counties going to approach this in a different manner. Uh, we anticipate there could be one or possibly two counties where there is an entity or organization that pays for dues for the entire county so that every jurisdiction within uh, would do that. Uh, that is a conversation that the folks in Polk County can certainly have. Um, we're agnostic as to the names on the check. Any involvement from the, like if Iowa State's applying for a grant, any involvement from Iowa State, DMAC, or any of the education institutions in what will be in our district? That's a very insightful question, and because DMAC and ISU in particular are very eligible for EDA grant funding, and they've, a lot of the funding that has come into this region from EDA has gone to those two entities right there. Um, there will be involvement and collaboration, uh, so we anticipate that there will be uh, board representation from IS, ISU and DMAC on this. In addition, there will be collaboration and support between the organizations for grant applications. Uh, for example, uh, MIPA has signed a letter of support for a grant application for Iowa State's grant application um, and have coordinated with DMAC on their pieces. And also, the SEDS document that the EDD is responsible for now becomes a valuable asset for their own grant applications. Maybe one step further, are they going to are they chipping in on it or sharing in the costs at all of the administration? No. Have you has Dart been engaged in this process at all? Dart? Yes. Mm, not to a great degree. Okay. Well, I guess I, I'm the Urbandale's representative on Dart, and I think we're having some. Uh, we're trying to figure out where we want to go and what we want to be in the future. And I think getting our larger community to understand the economic development uh, value of right. public transit is absolutely imperative um, right now. And so I would love to see um, DART at the table in, these, in this group somehow, um, or at least working with them um, adjacent. I think that um, part of telling DART's story is the value that it offers to um, businesses and development right. in the Metro. So uh, I'll speak to that in a, in a few different ways. The first is to say thank you. Um, I spent five years working at DART. I uh, was there for the DART Central Station opening and DART Forward 30, 2035, kind of a first big planning initiative a while back. And so I appreciate elected leaders standing up for DART and speaking out about its importance. Um, I think one, a couple of things for your awareness is transportation infrastructure is typically not an EDA eligible activity. And so it's kind of adjacent to transportation type systems. Uh, similarly, road building and stuff, it has to be pretty narrow considerations before those funding starts to become available for it. Um, and then I think your point about being, you know, adjacent to it, uh, all that, you know, funding eligibility aside, transportation came up in our public process when we were talking about um, for the comprehensive economic development strategy. And so transportation elements are there spoken to as goals and aspirations. Uh, so I think there are opportunities for us to work collaboratively. So let's say there is a project uh, that were involved in transit in Urbandale, we would be in a position to support that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, of course. All right, anything further? Gunnar, thank you. I, as you said, I'm very well aware of this. I fully support it. I think it's something we should be looking at from Urbandale's standpoint. So. Well, great. Thank, thank you. you we'll for be the in touch. Update. Andrew, thank you for being here, too. All right, uh, thank you. We will move on then to item 3.2, and that's an economic development update. Nice pivot to that. So first, I'll turn it over to you for that. Good, thank you, Mayor.
away we go. Thank you so much, Mayor and Council Members. At least once a year, we try to get in front of you, give you an update on what has been happening in the last year. And that is what we're about today. Before we go too much further, I want to make sure uh, that we recognize the members of the Economic Development Advisory Board that have joined us today. Matt Carlisle uh, with Confluence, Pat Pithan with MMIT, Susie Yemak with Homemakers, Cheryl Koyenga, just joined the board from Berkeley Technology Services, and Kurt Leverton is here, the founder of Pivotworks and CNL companies, which is still a valuable representative for us uh, from the manufacturing uh, perspective as well. So thank you uh, all very much for being here. I appreciate that and all the guidance that they give us over the year. In uh, a very compact presentation, we'll take a look at uh, economic development projects and potential touch base on the Merle Hay campus and downtown, and then uh, talk with you a little bit about the city business action meetings. That's our work with existing businesses. First, uh, the great news is uh, Aaron DeYoung, who unfortunately isn't able to be with us today uh, due to illness, but uh, Aaron put together a, uh, this simple chart that shows the development potential uh, in Urbandale. So this is looking at all of the available commercial, retail, and industrial land that's available. Admittedly, this is uh, probably getting on to about 10 or 12 months old, but uh, the, the message is the same. If we look at the bottom, still around 900 acres available. This is just within our uh, existing city boundaries. And applying uh, certain assumptions to those land use types, there's still room for over 30,000 jobs, 11 million square feet, and $988 million uh, of investment still. So the great news is, is that uh, that answer that sometimes, uh, is to the question that's sometimes asked, is Urbandale done growing? <laughs> Absolutely not. There is uh, plenty more opportunity across the community. So we see this as a great <laughs> sign, and hopefully you do uh, too. The Urban Loop has been uh, a very, very important part of those efforts. That chart shows land across the community, uh, but certainly that uh, interstate serve development areas, uh, which actually extends at least a couple miles uh, from the interchanges, has been a, a really important, uh, a really important part for us. We continue to uh, solidify this Urban Loop brand. Uh, through media and other marketing strategies. We have our monthly section uh, in the business record. And recently, uh, Derek Zarn, who's with us today as well, uh, worked with the United States Geological Survey to reclassify Ryder Corner as a historical place. We won't get into all of the, uh, all the technicalities about that, but the US Geological Survey <coughs> keeps track of place names and has different categories. The long and the short of it is uh, when a place is categorized as a historical place, that prevents it from showing up on Google Maps, uh, on Esri base maps, et cetera. So it's another step in just moving uh, this forward as really uh, identifying a geography here in the northwest part of the Des Moines Metro. So uh, Ryder Corner is still on the books, uh, but doesn't show up in the gray block letters on Google Maps as it used to. And then consistent with our strategic plan, uh, we've been working on an Urban Loop brand sustainability plan uh, with a subcommittee of the advisory board that'll be complete by the end of the year. Looking at the economic development potential since we launched the Urban Loop brand in the fall of 2017, so just uh, four years ago, uh, over 30 projects have developed across uh, the area in the core of the Urban Loop. And just touching on a couple uh, that have recently completed, Iowa Bankers Association is a 60,000 square foot corporate headquarters. The grand opening is on Thursday, so hopefully uh, you've received uh, the invite uh, from them uh, for that. And then uh, just opened last week uh, was the Quick Star at 100th Street and Plum Drive. So it'll be interesting to see how that opening starts to attract more uh, commercial attention in the area as well. 
uh, speaking of, uh, Quick Star also has a store underway at Douglas and 109th Street that appears to be moving along well. And then at 104th Street and Meredith Drive, uh, you can see uh, the investments that lead the way when the interchange is open uh, is a, another uh, Casey's store uh, right there. A couple projects that we expect to be coming up and uh, I'm sure won't be long until they're at the council table uh, would be the 20,000 square foot uh, office and R&D facility for Premier Tech and that's on the south side of Plum Drive, immediately east of the existing office building. And then Worldwide Logistics uh, is planning an 80,000 square foot Class A office building uh, on uh, Meredith Drive, just south of the Prairie Tower uh, on the former Day property, uh, which was purchased there. So it'll be exciting to see that come forward. And then uh, speaking of uh, potential that we have, a recent transaction, uh, is the reader property. So these, uh, the two rectangular pieces uh, were formerly the Hatch uh, family properties. Those have been purchased by the reader companies and that opens up another 36 acres of development with Interstate 3580 uh, visibility and access. So great to see another uh, development option uh, open. And then uh, the former Citigroup building at 121st and Meredith Drive in the northwest quadrant there, that building has been uh, available for lease since January of this year. It's 218,000 square feet in a in great location uh, right off the Meredith uh, interchange. And this has now been remarketed by r, &R as what's called the exchange building. So. Uh, um, identifying that as an available existing building in the market right off an interchange with office and warehouse is a great asset uh, for Urbandale as well. So having that mix of existing buildings and land is important to us. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> well, you're welcome and thank you. <laughs> We're glad to have the building. Touching base on the Merle Hay campus uh, revitalization. Uh, one step forward happened last month when the City of Des Moines Urban Design Review Board approved the campus master plan uh, for those 75 acres. And then uh, the Coles project, that'll move the existing Coles store to the site of the now former uh, Sears store. That has been uh, delayed to a spring start with a fall finish um, because of delays in construction materials. Uh, which uh, has been an issue that we'll talk about uh, in our existing business uh, update as well. And um, tomorrow night, I'll be presenting with the Bucks ownership and team president, as well as a mem uh, representative from Merle Hay Mall to the Central Iowa Taxpayers Association anniversary event. They're showcasing uh, investment projects across the region. And so uh, we'll be there as the city uh, plus the two private partners in that project uh, sharing information uh, about this uh, tomorrow night. And uh, the components of this project again, uh, first, the Buccaneer Arena and Training Center in the former Yonkers Food Court and Coles, a future hotel, a new retail center anchored by Coles on the south end and creating a corridor there between the north side of the mall and the new uh, construction a new retail out parcel there on Merle Hay Road uh, in front of where the old Sears used to be. And then mixed use improvements across the campus, including stormwater improvements, corridor upgrades, facade upgrades, uh, new tenants uh, in a reinvestment into the existing buildings. And uh, taking a closer look then at the Arena and Training Center, uh, this project is still in progress. It's a massive project with many moving parts. Our work continues to finalize plans for the arena to convert that former Yonkers and the 2B former Coles building. The Bucks owner is working with contractors, architects, sports facilities experts on the design and programming. A con critical component of this is final plans and construction estimates, which allow everything to move forward to a final application, uh, which needs to be submitted to the Iowa Economic Development Authority no later than February. So. This is a critical month for us for many pieces uh, of the puzzle to come together here uh, between the private sector partners, Merle Hay Mall and the Bucks, and everything that they're working on in terms of plans and construction 
and then the entitlements uh, from the city side. So uh, Aaron DeYoung has been uh, the main point person on this project and uh, he's been busy, but he's about to get a lot busier. So. <laughs> One positive thing that we've seen uh, spill over from this project has been uh, transactions in downtown Urbandale. This is a map that Aaron put together. Uh, the red shading shows uh, buildings that have uh, recently, uh, recently sold, which is a great sign. And anecdotally, we hear that uh, people are interested in the possibilities of what's happening downtown. So we see that as a great sign. And it also really points to the importance of the comprehensive plan and especially the uh, area studies uh, in the comprehensive plan. What we really need is a vision uh, for downtown that's uh, backed by uh, the city council so that then we can put the policies in place, uh, whether that's incentives, zoning, et cetera, to make that vision a reality. So we have the early interest, now we need the plan and vision uh, to be able to move that forward. So excited uh, to see that uh, start to happen. Now, this is the last uh, component of this, and uh, this is our city business action meetings. So taking a look at our existing business visit program, we have, uh, we count about 73 primary sector businesses. Uh, what's a primary sector business? Uh, the simplest terms, a primary sector business has most of its revenue coming from outside the state of Iowa. So we alternate, uh, alternately call these primary sector businesses or wealth generating businesses. So it's new wealth coming into our area that then is recirculated at the secondary sector uh, businesses. So we really have to pay the uh, primary or closest attention to those primary sector wealth generating businesses because they are the ones that bring in the wealth for the restaurants, the retail, the hotel, entertainment, et cetera. So of those 73, uh, since September of last year, we have had formal meetings with 35 of those businesses. And I can tell you that uh, it hasn't been easy in this last uh, year, as you can imagine, uh, to get those meetings scheduled. Um, all the layers of complexity from one, getting business owners' attention when they're legitimately up to their necks in supply chain, workforce, and COVID management issues. Uh, and then when we do get the uh, attention of the businesses, coordinating whether that's in person or online, who's going to be there and available, et cetera. But uh, we work with the IDA and Mid-American Energy to really uh, get as many of those visits accomplished as possible. So we're at about half of where we wanna be. We continue a pretty aggressive push uh, to try to get in front of those businesses every year. Uh, some of the businesses that uh, relationship has lagged a little bit, we're reaching out to them with thank you notes and an Urban Loop mug and coffee. So we'll do whatever it takes to get their attention, let them know that they're appreciated, and hopefully that opens the door uh, to a future conversation. We also uh, have had in mind for a couple years now an event uh, to really re-engage and recognize the businesses in Urbandale. As you can imagine, that, like everything, has been complicated due to COVID. Uh, but we really hope to work again with a committee of the advisory board to get an event planned for 2022. Two slides left. Um, the top concerns that we've heard from businesses, <coughs> are, uh, number one and over every single other thing is workforce. Uh, we just need uh, people uh, to uh, come to work. We need more people in Iowa generally, so that is uh, the number one issue. Number two is supply chain. It is rippling everywhere. You've read the same articles. I have retailers planning on the holiday season. Um, uh, stuff is stuck on boats. Uh, people are, uh, uh, production is behind. So supply chain is a major issue. Those two things dominate everything else which can be lumped in the category. Uh, and this is not all inclusive of when we ask what are the things that you need to be successful in Urbandale, we hear about the amenities. So retail, restaurant, and entertainment options always come up. Um, they love the trail connections, want more of them, more opportunities uh, over the lunchtime. So things like adding the sidewalks on 104th Street are an immense, uh, are a great amenity for our workforce. We hear about the airport service. Again, it, everything's in the category of it's good, could it be better? Um, and so we hear about that. And then miscellaneous infrastructure, uh, everything from we need a better fiber connection, which thankfully we're able to help with, 
to uh, items that uh, might be timing of a traffic signal, filling of a pothole. And to that, I really want to credit uh, John Larson, Tim Stovey. Uh, they get right on that stuff, and it's wonderful to be able to close the loop with a business who talks about signal timing. We take it to engineering, they look at it, and then we come back and say we've adjusted it. So um, having that internal loop to be able to serve businesses is, is critical. There have been uh, a few key things that we've noticed as a result of COVID. Uh, several businesses have gone virtual. Um, I think uh, that was to be expected. Thankfully, it was uh, only uh, several uh, so far. I think it's more or less stabilized as we take the temperature from uh, our primary uh, sector businesses. Return to office has been delayed, uh, unlike the, some who have gone fully virtual. Uh, we are definitely seeing p uh, businesses see the value of being in office. <coughs> it's just a, a matter of moving the goalposts uh, when they'll come back in. But post COVID, this location flexibility is becoming very common. So we're hearing uh, that people are being given the opportunity to work a couple days uh, a week out of the office or to have more flexibility in location. And then number four, thankfully, I think we've come out of this uh, with no major downsizings uh, announced to date. So that's very positive for economic development. So with that, I am going to close and ask if there are any questions that we can address. All right. Thank you, Cooker. Any questions from the council? All right. <laughs> You did a great job. Wow. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Well, I won't expect that every time. <laughs> Thank you. And, and thanks to the members of the EDAB that are here today, too. I'm sorry, we're getting some HVAC work done this weekend. Or this, like, they were here over the week. I saw the big crane over the weekend. They're just now finishing the installation. Yeah. So apologize for the noise up there. But again, thanks to the EDAB uh, for everybody who's uh, uh, on the board and who are here today. I really do appreciate your contributions to the, to the board and, and your contributions to our community. So thank you for being here today and thank you for taking a role on this and helping us along with our economic development strategy. It's really appreciated. So thank you. Thanks so much, Mayor. Uh, before I cede the podium, um, I will also point out Kristen Stromer uh, is here. I'll just take a moment. She's the new uh, executive assistant in the administrative wing. Uh, so Kristen uh, joined us this week. Up next uh, will be John Larson, uh, Director of Engineering and Public Works, who will walk through Complete Streets, and then I believe John and or Tim uh, will go into the snow and ice policy. So I'll sit down and All take right. notes for AJ. Great. Thank you, Curtis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, today I just wanted to talk a little bit about our CIP process and mostly focus on the complete streets or specifically complete streets projects. Um, as you know, this year is kind of my first year in a different role with the CIP process. So we've gone through, reviewed the specific uh, complete streets projects, just kind of looked at, you know, how are their budgets looking, what are the timings, and, and that's kind of where we're at in the whole CIP process is we're in the process of everybody suggested their projects, we're looking at when can they be done, what are their budgets before we go to the CIP committee. But some of these topics or items we're gonna look at, I think are more directed towards council decisions than really the, the CIP committee. Uh, it's not so much the funding is, it's the policy decisions with it. Um, and then also just wanna mention just a little bit about our complete streets. I think a lot of good things came out of the complete street study that we did. Uh, I think we learned from talking to the residents that they really preferred our separated bike lanes um, like we're constructing versus being being on street. That's why we did the redesign on the Waterford Road, as I'm showing here, that you know we did the separated bike lane uh, onto the north side. Um, and we've also, you know, we'll be doing that on our Douglas Urbanization Project. Then next year it's planned on our 170th Street Project. And then I think through the complete streets, I think that's really kind of how we ended up with our, our 10 foot trail that'll go along the soccer softball complex and then up north to Plum to make that, that connection. Um, but I want to kind of mention though that 
the study that we had done is kind of a high level study. Um, you know, they looked at where would it be nice to have trails and where do we need some connections for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, but they didn't necessarily look at are, what are the other constraints to physically building them. So that's kind of what we've done with the CIP is try to look more, what are the constraints that we, that we have out there? You know, it's not just a flat world that's easy on paper to say every, everything fits in, in the right of way. So as I kind of go through, I'll kind of stop at a couple points in here, a little different than normal, maybe to have a little discussion, just make sure that we're all on the same page. I didn't want to get too far through the process, pay for engineering, and then find out Council had maybe a different vision than, than where we were headed from, from the report. So again, as I was saying, you know, I think we've had good success out here on Waterford Road. I can say, even though we're not done, I've been out there, I've seen people using, using the trail already. So I think this one's looking good. Our first one is, is a pretty straightforward project, but it ties into a couple of our others. So we have 70th Street here on the left-hand side, but it's where Urbandale Avenue breaks off from 70th, comes on down to Des Moines. We've got an eight-foot trail from 68th Street that continues east into Des Moines and ties into their system. What we're proposing is this area here is to remove our four-foot sidewalk, widen that out to eight foot so we have a better connection on down in, into Des Moines. Again, I think this one is fairly straightforward and appears that we don't have a lot of constraints with this project but it does tie into our 70th Street project. And just to kind of show where we're at there, up on the top of on the left-hand side, this is Meredith Drive. So we'll continue south on 70th Street. We go by the high school and Aurora Avenue, continuing south through over on, on the right-hand side through Douglas. And then we tie back into where I was kind of showing where Urbandale Avenue swings off, off to the east. So just kind of get a feel for, for where we are at. So what's proposed in the complete streets plan is to have a, a street level separated bike lane. So basically our bike lanes will be, will be on the street. So what they're recommending is that we reduce the four lane section that we have on the road to a two lane and do, doing that with the pavement markings where basically your outside two lanes become the bike lanes. Um, where we do come to major intersections like Aurora or the Douglas, we'll still want to have a left turn lane there so we'll have have to work on how we intermingle the bikes and the cars as we come to the major intersections. But with this one, the main thing I want to point out, make sure everybody's aware and make sure we're all, all on board with, is from Madison, which is just north of Douglas, up to Meredith. Currently, we allow parking in those outside two lanes. In order to accomplish this, we would have to eliminate the parking in those outside two lanes. I just know when uh, the church came in at Townsend, that wasn't really a popular thing within the public, and I just wanted to like I said, just stop for a second and just make sure everybody is on the same page that that, that is our plan, that we would eliminate that parking and, and turn those into the bike lanes. Can you put up the map again? Sure. So where we're talking is with Douglas here, every, everything to the north here. So we're heavily residential <clears throat> in that area. John, for a little historical perspective, years ago when I was on the Board of Adjustment, there was some question about the bus lane for the school. And one of the options at that time was to take the parking off of 70th Street as you're proposing. And it met with great opposition at those meetings that we had. Again, that was 10 years ago, but I know those residents are very sensitive to having the ability to park on 70th Street. And then certainly during the football games, that gets utilized. So you probably are already aware of that, but I just historically point that out to you. Being a numbers guy, so help me with the math a little bit. So how wide of a street are we talking about here? Um, 70th Street. I apologize. I don't know that I have that. Okay, I guess it was... I believe, I believe it's roughly little over 40 feet, like roughly 42 feet. And so if we're gonna take our four lanes, take it down to two, are we putting a turn lane in the middle there? O only at the major intersections. So again, as we come to like Aurora, we'll have a left turn lane there. As we come down to Douglas, we will, but the rest, rest of the, call them the residential streets, I don't, don't envision that we would. So we're gonna give bikes as much space as we're giving right now for lane of traffic? That, that's what's currently proposed, yes. Okay, and do we have, 
I guess, how much traffic is through here? If we were to rebuild the street today, would we build it as a two-lane street for the amount of traffic that's there? So, right, so I looked that up based on the DOT's 2016 count. So from Meredith to Douglas, we're about 6,600 vehicles a day. Right south of Douglas is about 6,900 vehicles a day. And then when we get down by Urbandale Avenue, it's about just around 4,300 vehicles a day. And, we'd and, be talking, we'd yeah. be talking roughly a little over 3,000 a day in, in each direction in those lanes. Right, and I guess if you were to build a street for 6,000 vehicles a day or 7,000 vehicles a day, what size street would you build? Through here on 70th, I think we would look at likely that being a three-lane facility, just so you can have the left the left turn lanes at at all the different residential streets. Right. I I guess if you're looking for feedback from us, I'm not sure I feel comfortable um, without talking to the neighborhood. I mean, this is, seems like a huge shift to do without um, specific. Um, invitation to discuss with the um, with the adjacent property owners, I think, with the church and the football stadium and high school there, that's very particular land uses that we don't have in some of the other areas where we're contemplating this. I mean, I'm all for more and better and safer accommodations for our um, bicyclists and trail users, but this is a this is a something I want to talk about with the neighbors before we um, move forward with it on the um, I don't know if this is a CIP project that you're giving us a heads up about or this is currently in the CIP. Today. So okay. again. We just did some review on the cost estimates and what exactly the descriptions, just to make sure we understood what the complete streets plan had, had in place and that we were matching it in the CIP. And again, for instance, this being, I think, a fairly big item, I didn't want to get us all the way to the, we're going out to bid and hey, by the way, we're also going to take away the parking at, at the yeah. same time. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of some of the different different things we're seeing with the projects. And, well, and I guess where I was going with my questioning was more back to the, the initial design. I think two lane versus a three lane. I, I think two lane is very restrictive from a traffic flow standpoint, regardless of the parking issue. I think the parking issue is a separate item. So if we're going to, to look at it, I don't know. I think the three lane with bike lanes on the outside would be a better design yeah, plan I, on it than... And now we've got to see, see if parking is an option or not, or is an issue, too big of an issue for the neighborhood to even move forward with a three lane design in essence. Right, and I think that's what we'll look at it further to the south, but I think we start getting into that challenge on how narrow do we want the lanes to go for that three lanes and how much room does that leave us on the outside, outside for a bike lane. So, and that's one of those things on here, I think there's, tons of different ways maybe to do these. We were trying to stick to the recommendations in the report and, and kind of start start there. There's a couple things. Yes, yes, we could meet with the, with the residents. You know, we could look at, do we do we want to spend the money to hire a consultant and, and go closer on to this one and look, look at what would the three lanes look like? Can we make it fit? Do we need to widen? Just, you know, there, there's additional steps I think we can take. We just didn't want to go there before we kind of talked about the actual right. report recommendations. And then also, I guess I'd look at what some of our neighbors have done, which is they've used the ancillary streets. So like they've used a 67th street as a way to cut through here with a shared road mentality of bikes and cars, not putting in its own separate lane, keeping a 70th street intact as a four lane road. Correct. And there were some recommendations that could be done just similar to that with paint only. We're in the process of getting those evaluated and our hope is through after the winter that we'll be able to start in the spring and start some painting some of those locations as well. I do think, and again, I'm probably, the, I think I am the biggest advocate for the complete streets. <laughs> and I think we need to be fully utilizing this. I do think we are behind uh, as in the region where we are identifying uh, other paths uh, and, and to make make this uh, friendly for all uh, folks, but I, in this case on 70th Street, I, I think there's maybe another design, John, uh, other than what this is maybe proposed. And I think, it, but I think at a minimum, though, we do need to be looking more uh, uh, more comprehensively at, at identifying 
the bike uh, locations and the lanes, uh, but by paint, particularly by paint, I think we can do some things. I, you know, I think if I, as I go to other cities around here, I see where, you know, bikes, at least you have the awareness that bikes are sharing the road. Sure. And I don't think we have done that as enough, as much as we can. Uh, I think that maybe is a solution for 70th Street, that at least it, we create more bike awareness through the through the paint, uh, but maybe not do a total redesign of the road itself. Okay, and, and we, we can look at the, at that some more. Because then the next, the next one I'm looking at here just is the next piece to the south. This one has some, some definite challenges as far as just constructability and engineering um, come down here. So where we're at is, again, where Urbandale Avenue heads to the east. We're looking at 70th down to Hickman Road. Um, point of reference is just that Hopkins Road is roughly in the middle. That, that's where we notice a change. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But what they've recommended here is on-street bike lanes, so that would require us to widen the road four feet on, on each side. Um, I think it would have some impacts on, on driveways. There's a few trees in the right-of-way we would need to remove. There's some existing retaining walls that we'd either have to modify or rebuild. And I think we may need some new retaining walls. Um, it's going to require, likely require some new right-of-way and, and easements. Um, as of right now, we're kind of looking at narrowing the bikes and having them share as we go through a culvert. Again, if we could replace the culvert, that would require some more right-of-way easements and uh, increase the cost. And through here, it's, it's fairly narrow, so we do have some concerns with snow storage and just having room for our utilities. And the way we have it right now, kind of at a minimalist, a minimal approach to it, is we're just a little over a million dollars. So to kind of show what I'm talking about today, we've got a 24-foot road within a 50-foot right-of-way. What's different about this was normally when we build the road, we center it through the right-of-way the entire time. This one here, the road kind of winds through the right-of-way a little bit. I think they were trying to work with the grades that they had. So what that also does to us is it reduces the distance we have from the back curb to, to the right-of-way, especially, especially on the one side where we're, we're looking at between the back of curb, we've got roughly you know, six to seven, seven feet is all, but then there's spots where the four foot sidewalk due to the grades has been moved closer to the curb. So anywhere it could be one to four foot off the property line, which again makes makes grading a little little tougher. So we were in a in a perfect world, you know, we'd have our two 11 foot lanes centered in the right of way, and then the bike lanes on the outside, which, which would only leave us three feet between the curb to the sidewalk. So not a lot of room to work work with our grades. And then you still need to have your power poles, your utility poles in that area. Whereas we get to the southern half of the project, we've got a 60-foot right-of-way, which that extra 10 feet makes makes a big difference on having things fit. So I just wanted to just kind of show you show you the constraints that we have. Um, basically, this is just south of Urbandale Avenue. And the east side over here is about four and a half feet wide, and the right-of-way line is right behind the sidewalk. When we look at our other side, the grass is, is roughly seven feet. So if we were going to look to try to widen, you'd, you'd probably look for maybe only a couple feet on the one side. The rest would be on the other, which means we need to move the sidewalk over. We're still trying to stay within the right of way, but we'd have quite a bit of grading to, to do within their yard. And like I was mentioned with the snow, right now we don't have a lot of room to, to store our snow. We move our curb, and curb over another couple feet. We really don't have a place place for the snow. And that's where this next one kind of shows where we've got, you know, the same kind of constraints, four foot on one side, roughly seven on the other. We've got the power poles, the utility poles. <clears throat> so there's just, just, just some challenges on, on trying to fit in, you know, that extra pavement within, within a very, very tight corridor. Right. Um, as we get down, down to Rockland Courts here, kind of interesting as you look through, the right-of-way line is actually between the curb and the sidewalk. The sidewalk's outside the right-of-way. And as you can see, you know, the structure is right there. Um, we look on the other side, there's quite a few things going on. So trying to do all the widening to one side, I think is, is definitely gonna be, be a challenge through there. And hey John, wasn't that already tore up this past year? Right yeah, there? there was a water main project where they did some yeah, I remember for quite a while, there was residents were disrupted there. Yep. yep. And so if you were to move forward, would you have to tear that all back up again? I, I would hope not. I hope we can leave the sidewalk where it is at. And I guess going back to the mayor's comments about, you know, painting more bike awareness 
on this versus totally redesign. I mean, painting bike awareness is a couple thousand dollar solution. Yeah. Which, which is, I, again, I think, I'll bring up one other suggestion they had. I think that's a little out there is that you, you paint the outside for the bikes and you leave the center lane for the cars and the cars, when they meet head to head, they just move over into the bike lanes and then come back together. Well, and I guess what I'm saying, bike awareness is a share the road bike awareness. Right, right. Piece. I'm just saying that not, that, not that was their, their thoughts, and I thought for the for the you know central Iowa that might be a little bit of a stretch to yeah. be sending people head to head. So I think we could look at look at it more. You know, your sharrows and share share the lanes and, and things like that. Just again, want to have the conversation because it doesn't exactly match match with the complete streets was recommended for for solutions that I, I think we we'd be fine with going to call it more the basic the basic improvements that can, can help with the sharing. Because at the end of this road, we really don't intersect with a major trail system yet either. Correct, we're just teeing into Hickman there. Right, which is and, so. And we do have a major trail system not that far away. You've got right. the belt where you've got the trails not, it kind of leads you to the same spot. Just leads you to the other side of the old Kmart store. Right, I mean, yeah, if you go a half mile west, you have a major trail system that's protected and all the way, you know, if you're headed downtown, you're not taking this. That's, that's, that was my only thought. This seems like a really big disruption to the area. I, I, run, I run this by the high school all the time. I don't see that many bikes, but I'm only there, you know, in this short window. But um, this seems like a big disruption for the addition of, of the bike lanes. Okay. And again, that's kind of the direction I need that we'll, we'll look at. I guess two things. One, needing the direction, and then we can start with the cost. Because again, I don't want to have a huge widening cost number in here that hurts other CIP projects no. if this isn't the direction direction to continue. So maybe I'll try to move through some of these maybe a little faster. Uh, I guess just one thing to point out, for instance, like the driveway along, this is already at a 16%. So I think we'd have to find some way to widen all the one side because there's not a lot we can do with the driveway or it could result in reconstructions to raise the road just, just to protect the driveway. And again, there's a couple of trees that are in the right of way. So I think, I think I've got direction on that one. Then our next one is um, Aurora Avenue, looking at it from 86th Street to Merle Hay. And what was proposed in there is to construct an eight foot wide trail, and that would be done by on Aurora Avenue where we have the four lanes, we'd reduce it down to three lanes, and that would roughly be from 86th Street down to Jensen Elementary. And then the rest of the way, we're at a five lane road that we'd go to four lanes the rest of the way to Merle Hay, and that's roughly about $1.85 million. To kind of explain that a little bit more, so this is one where we do have the 42-foot road, and it varies how much distance we have from the back of curb to the front of the sidewalk. It is seven to that nine and a half, but the majority of the corridor is closer to that seven feet. Um, and this is also kind of a different corridor in the sense that we have you know, a stretch where the power poles are on the south side, then we go through a stretch where we've got power poles and light poles on one side and light poles on the other, and then all of a sudden, then we've got the power poles on the north side of the road. So it's, it's you know, I don't think we want to be having our trail go back and forth on different sides. So we were looking at it being more on the north side. Again, the tough part about that is if we're at seven feet, uh, those power poles have a two foot diameter. So by the time we do another four foot trail onto, and another four foot for the trail, and then we have the power poles, we don't have enough room to have recommended clear zone from those power poles to the side, side of the street. So what it would it take to do through that is we'd have to remove a portion of the outside lane, that north lane, so that when we're, we would have three lanes of travel, we could take those power poles, move those to the south, and then widen out the trail. It'd be a similar thing when we got down to the five lane section, other than it's maybe a little bit tighter, but the power poles are at least on the, next to the right of way outside of the bike lanes, but we do the same thing. We'd remove a portion of that outside lane um, and then widen, widen out the trail. So just kind of show, you know, by 86th Street, it's fairly clear through here, but what we would have is this lane here, we would have a lane for eastbound, We'd have a two-way left turn lane here, and then we would have one lane going west, and, and the majority of this lane would be removed, and the sidewalk would be widened. 
um, as we came through areas like the middle school where we've got a turn lane, we'd have to look at the turn lane moving out here and then removing a portion and get getting how we would transition through there. And then we get closer to the high school, that's what I'm talking about. We got the large poles, so I think this project would be fairly disruptive in the time it would take for us to remove the portion of pavement. We'd have to wait for mid-am to move move all the poles, and then we could come back and do, do the trail portion. As we get closer down by Jensen, then we've got a four-lane roadway with the median. The median was installed to help control access on, on the south side of the road, so I think we'd have to look at probably removing, removing the median there and then continuing with removing this outside lane. And then as we get closer down in the five lane section, we'd have the two lanes <coughs> east, we'd have our left turn lane here, and then one lane for, for the westbound, and then we'd remove this portion. And it's kind of different as we get down to closer to Merle Hay, as we've actually got the sidewalk right at the back of the curb, and as we move a little further down, the sidewalk moves away from the back of the curb, but instead of grass, we have concrete, and we got a fire hydrant there and some other things that we'd have to look at. It's not technically in the sidewalk, but it's kind of within in that concrete area. So again, this is where I just wanted to check. We're just under a couple million dollars, but this is one, if you proceeded with removing that outside lane, there's really no turning back after, after you did that. And again, how that would impact, you know, the traffic flow, our volumes, volumes that we're looking out there are, are less, <coughs> excuse me, you know, at the west end by 86th Street, we're, you know, 4,500 for an ADT. Down, when you get down, down here by Merle Hay, though, we're, we're just under 9,000. And then we're at Jensen, Jensen Elementary, it's still about 6,000 vehicles a day. John, we had talked years ago about changing Aurora from 70th to 86 from, yep. you know, one lane each way with a continuous left turn right. and trails on each, uh, bike lanes on each side. Correct, and that's something we pulled. I just don't, re I showed this on there. I just know before there wasn't as much comfort level with with the on street and with the schools. And that's the other thing I want to see if there's been a change, change in that. Well, but that would be a less expensive solution. Correct. To that too, wouldn't it? And correct, we, correct. We could, I mean, it's gonna be a little bit different east of Merle Hay to, or east of 70th to Merle Hay, but you still could accommodate that in some respects east of there. I, I, I envision that's a good solution for Aurora through there. And if you look at, you know, if you look what Des Moines did on Douglas, I mean, Douglas, uh, from Merle Hay to, to Beaver, I mean, they've accommodated one lane each way with, with a continuous turn lane right. and bike lanes on each side. I think that, that gets a lot more traffic than this does. I think right. we could easily accommodate this in, on Aurora. I think that's maybe a better and more cost-effective solution. The biggest thing, too, just, just to note with that, though, is there will be somewhat of the appearance, because once you remove the pavement markings, since we have all that asphalt, everything gets scarred, so we'd have to decide, are we redoing the overlays, or or what are we looking to do there? But that's just, just one of the concerns is we, when, you get we, the, when you scar the pavement, removing. But again, that's why I included this one at the end. Again, it was talked about a while back. I think through the CIP committee, they weren't, weren't necessarily in favor, so I just wanted to bring up that option again as well. Yeah, and, and I guess for me, it's some of the uniqueness. Having a student driver drive through here every day, I would be freaked out as a parent if he had bike lanes on both sides, he had to also drive through. So um, that's part of it for me is we've got, at the high school, we got a lot of student drivers going through this area. Is there, I guess I go back to that ancillary road. Is there a Townsend? Is there a something north south that we aren't putting bikes next to 9,000 cars a day? And again, I think that is something we could look at, look at in more detail. I think, again, our original study was just looking at the main corridors people identified, but I think we could look for maybe parallel corridors that might might work or function as well. Right, because it, you know, if you're putting bikes next to a thousand to two thousand cars a day, I think that's a lot different than nine thousand cars a day that's running through this area. Well, what's, um, what's on Douglas? What's on Ingersoll? Well, and that's why you have the separated. You know, um, they're not separate. They're, they're, they've got the physical barriers between them, and some of those at least that I've written. So, I, I agree with the mayor. I think you know, Aurora is is a street we ought to be looking at because of the schools. I mean, the, you know, the middle school in particular. There could be a lot of kids who want to ride bikes. 
And, you know, we did approach it before, and any time you try to change anything, you get a storm of protest. But I, I think Aurora is one, one that we ought to be looking at. Yeah, I guess I, I like the idea of doing, and, and Mayor, were you just thinking between 86, 70th and 86th? Well, I mean, that was what was proposed before we, you know, with it, the, at the time, Dave wanted to, uh, Dave McKay wanted to do it, and we had the time to put permanent paint in, and it would have been perfect. And like, you know, the council didn't agree with it at that point. Right. I don't know. Instead I, of doing um, the up to the permanent, we did more of a water-based paint. Yep. Yeah. I guess I'd, I'm, I'm more open to. I like that idea um, better than the the first project we looked at because it is kind of it's it kind of partly Main Street Urbandale and having more of a a, a multi multi medium traversing it. Um, I think that's probably a better spot to look at it. I guess I don't really, I, I wouldn't, what we've looked at with the uh, bike lanes on the street is, uh, this is probably as good a spot to do it. Absolutely up north from Meredith. You can think about that. East, west, Meredith, consider east, west for Aurora. I do not have the numbers with me. I'm pretty sure those traffic volumes are higher though on, on that road. <laughs> I mean, Aurora is already 25 miles an hour, so people shouldn't be, you know, flying through here anyway. So, I mean, I think, I think, anyway, that's just my thought. It's been calming effect, and it's it's probably not a bad idea just to get the school to weigh in on it, just because they've got, I don't know, maybe, maybe, I'm just thinking they've got a lot of frontage right along there. Do they like that idea too? And that might be somebody to help support support doing it. I would think this would be something they they would be in favor of. Can you go back to that picture in front of the middle school? Can you go by there? Don't you see parents waiting on their seat? And they're just in a long line of cars. Okay, I guess we do have that with. We're going to queue up from beginning about 2.30 and, and, until 8 o'clock, I believe. Yes. Because that was a concern. That, the school bus turned in there somewhere, isn't it? The turn lane's the next driveway up is the turn lane for the school bus. Yeah. So I think, yeah, you, you would have some periods where I guess parent pickup and if, if we were looking students to ride, I think we'd have a little bit of a conflict flick there. But again, at least that's kind of a limited time of the day. But as you say, that I don't know if you'd have to use the sidewalks for part of that. John, can you clarify for me what you're looking for from us on this? More, again, it, what's, what was in the CIP was to follow, uh, and Aurora specifically, was to follow what the Complete Street Study had said with reducing the lanes and, and having a, a separate separate trail. So one, seeing is that the direction we want to go, or as we're discussing here, do we want to look at, at a different direction? Because we could look at, if we wanted to do it, kind of that, that test is you could do 86 to 70th. I think we'd probably look to Maybe maybe mill off the top couple inches, put down new asphalt, and then and then paint it for kind of that three lanes plus the outside bike lanes it is an option we could pursue. Well, I mean, I think the street looks bad, uh, so I'm not opposed. I don't know what I mean. I know that's not a reason to re um, redo it, but that price tag really gives me pause for the whole project. Um, and then considering the safety issues of that whole section between 86th and 70th with the schools there. So I don't know. I, I, I need more time to, um, to contemplate this. And just throw in, I mean, here we can, we can see the joints, but that, that's pretty normal with the asphalt is that we come through when you have concrete underneath the joints come through and we seal them. You know, Roar's not in, in too bad a shape. I would just be more worried about removing the markings and just scarring the pavement because then you're going to see the old markings and at night it's going to be a lot harder to tell where you're supposed to drive and not drive. So I guess, I you, the, the problem I'm having is, is that with the study we just had completed on the stormwater and the cost it's going to take to, to, you know, take care of the east side of Urbandale, um, I'm hesitant to throwing, you know, million dollars at a shot on a street to change it to complete streets. If we can do the painting for something more reasonable, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. 
Uh, if we can take this existing street and narrow it down and create bike lanes, narrow it down to three lanes so you have a turn lane, um, you know, I, it, that makes a lot of sense to me. But to drop a million dollars and do reconstruction when some people are there worrying that the next rain is going to flood their basement for the 10th time this year, I, I'm kind of hesitant about doing that. Right, and that's what I was saying earlier is, so we're just trying to find where we want to be because ultimately then the projects start competing against each other and right, those new storm sewer ones, we're going to have to look at funding for those as well. But I do think if, you know, they, they're kind of tied together because if we're going to do a major storm sewer project, I would think that that would be the time to look at that street to make sure it's in compliance with our complete streets at the same time when it's all torn up. That kind of makes sense to me, but um, you know, you know, that, that's just my position where I'm coming at on this. And I guess for me, it's more that, I mean, I think a total rebuild of the street area, sidewalk, everything seems like it's out. I'm not hearing anybody saying we want to do that, but it's kind of, is it a three lane bike lane or I, kind of go back to, is there a parallel route? And I'm picking on Townsend that bikers still get half mile gap between Douglas and Meredith trail stuff. Um, you're off one block basically, and you, you get out of the main thoroughfare road. So is there a way to find some parallel routes that maybe the complete streets didn't have? That would be something I'd like to see too. But the goal is you, you gotta make streets safe everywhere, not just, you know, you're not just trying to find a trail somewhere for folks. I mean, folks need to, they're not just biking just for pleasure uh, at all times too, so. No, and I'm trying to find a commuter route of biking, and I just, I don't know if, and that's why I was looking for something that goes all the way through. Um, well, I mean, I think it's worth considering here in front of the, the school section to I mean, you're doing some traffic call. I mean, that I'm not there during pickup time and most most of the time I'm not there um, to know that there's speeding and things like that, but I've heard that there's a, a lot of that issue there. And so if we do a redesign, even with painting on the street, you're gonna slow traffic down and ultimately yeah. make it safer at a substantially lower cost, I would think, than 1.8. Million dollars because I'm with Ron about the hundred million dollars of storm sewer um, weighing down on us um, as we weigh other projects. Well, you know, we can't, yes, we have a lot of priorities, we have a lot of competing priorities. I do think. You know, I, I guess I'm along the same lines. I'm a, I'm a very strong advocate that we need to be having better identity for, for all modes of transportation. I do think we are behind in doing that. I think we can also be smart about it and do it on a cost-effective basis too. And maybe it isn't a brand new redesign everywhere, but maybe it is a lot of things we can do with some shorter redesigns that are, that are, um, a lot less cost, a lot more cost effective, a lot less costly to do a total rebuild. But but I do think we should be looking at some things like, you know, uh, one lane each way with a continuous turn lane and bike lanes on the side. And so, I guess maybe as a starting point, 70th Street. I think we'll look closer if, on what we can do with just just paint and still kind of keep the parking there. What what options we have, and then when it comes to to this stretch, do we start the CIP process with, like I said, 86 to 70th with, with a three lane with the bike lanes and, and kind of let it start itself through through that process and at least see if we can get 86th Street to 70th as kind of that, that test area as a starting point? Well, I think that area would be more of a priority because of the, you know, the schools and the park there um, to, to do as a starting area. And again, I think that gives me me the direction I was I was looking for. That okay. again, we can at least not hold up other projects in the CIP and then have to vet it out out right. later, get more of a head start on it. Right. I, I tried real hard to confuse you thoroughly. So <laughs> hopefully, we succeeded. That's why everybody else listens and they're they're taking the notes. Okay. All right, that, and that is all I had today. Thank you. Thanks, John. Mayor, I noticed here um, we're just after one o'clock. I know that uh, the snow and ice probably is timely, unfortunately, to discuss. Do you have 
10 or 15 more minutes. You want to can everybody take 10 or 15 more minutes to get through the, the snow? Yeah. Snow and then I think the special event signage, I just touched base with Steve. Um, he's actually prepared uh, a memo, so that could be transmitted uh, through a weekly update uh, for further discussion, if that's okay. Yep, that sounds okay, good. So we'll do the snow and ice. Tim is just itching to talk about ice and snow, aren't you? I guess. <clears throat> I will be very brief here. In November sometime, we will present the snow and ice policy as part of the consent agenda. Um, there will be ma major changes as all in all with that. It just be you know adjusting routes, personnel, etc. But it's been a long time since we've gone to council and said, here are our service levels. You know, the staff and council agree on what service levels we should be providing for snow and ice control. What you see in front of you is our our main focus. We we, we call our routes red, yellow, and green, and these are our arterial streets. These are our major collectors and some minor collectors on there. These receive our highest level of service. We pre-treat all, all these if conditions warrant. We, uh, these are what we hit first thing in the snowstorm. We put down recommended levels of salt, other chemicals on those. Obviously these streets carry the most traffic at the highest, at the highest speeds. And these are where we th throw most of our resources. And uh, you know, if you look at this, your average Urbandale resident only has to drive about a quarter mile before they hit these roads. And uh, you know, most people really don't care what their residential street looks like, just as long as they can get through it. <laughs> Once they hit a main road, that's when they kind of want to breathe and be able to see bare pavement, you know, roads that you know snow has been removed from from curb to curb. And our goal with these is to get down to bare pavement as soon as possible. You know, sometimes that takes four hours, other times that might take two days, depending on conditions. So we uniformly treat these. We've got four crews of four dump trucks that plow all these at once. Obviously, you might have five, six lanes in there. So that's the level of service on our main roads. In the yellow here, we kind of call these our secondary mains. They're really technically not uh, defined as that. But these are these are just routes through residential areas to lessen that you know, quarter of a mile down to about a tenth of a mile. So if you look, for instance, Parkview Drive and Townsend Avenue, 66th Street, 75th Street, once we get into these residential routes, those are the first routes we'll open. And again, that's just to uh, decrease the amount of time people or amount of distance people have to travel to a treated and plowed street. And that also includes, I mean, industrial park in here receives a little bit higher priority, but uh, I think you kind of get the idea. And what we do with these is basically spot treat these with, with salt. So we don't uniformly apply the salt. We put them in intersections, uh, intersections leading to the mains, hills, things like that. Obviously around schools is a priority too. And, you know, there's just a couple quick pictures. And stepping back a little bit, and then after that, we go into our residential streets and our cul-de-sacs. And this is kind of what we hope to achieve on, a, on a, an arterial street. This is kind of what we hope to achieve on a, a residential collector, you know, to where we get some, some bare pavement showing in the wheel paths. And this is pretty typical of a residential street. And our policy is not to use salt on residential streets. Is that realistic? No, you've got some hills and intersections around schools, like I mentioned. But, uh, you know, some of our neighbors, they have a goal of getting getting these residential streets down to bare pavement. We don't have that goal. It's just, you know, salt is cheap to purchase, but it, you know, does a ton of the damage to the environment, does a ton of damage to pavement and vegetation. And, uh, you know, I think for the most part, people in Iowa ought to be able to traverse through a street, a residential street, <laughs> you know, with some snowpack on it. So, <clears throat> and we, we've been sticking with that, that level of service for some, some time, unless we, like I say, unless we hear differently, we want, we'd like plan on sticking to that, so. And a couple things that, oh, one thing I wanted to hit on was workload, how we're doing. Uh, normally what we look at as a threshold is once we get above 35 miles per dump truck, 35 lane miles of responsibility, we, we start thinking about adding people and, and trucks. And once we get, a, get, about, get above about 35 cul-de-sacs per pickup, we look at adding things. So we're getting up there you can see from our dump trucks, we went from a high of about 33.4 eight years ago. We'll be to 32.8 this next year. Cul-de-sacs, high of 36.4 per operator, and we're sneaking up on that pretty soon. 
And real briefly, a couple things AJ wanted me to hit on is how we're gonna handle the snow removal on these complete street sections. And after a staff discussion, we, just, we decided this is gonna be too much, obviously, for a resident to handle a 15-foot section like that. And I think we, we, <laughs> we, we presume that, uh, you know, we presume that the residents will demand that that asphalt trail be kept clean all winter. So we plan on taking care of that. Um, Are you gonna a, take care of the asphalt and the concrete? Yes. Okay. Yep, we'll take care of both of them. Now, normally what we do is our parks department does take care of a lot of, the, this is a 10 foot trail section on Waterford uh, west of 156. We do not, if it butts up to a residential area, we do not do anything on these. We do require the property owner to p remove snow from a five foot segment of that. So like I said, we, our parks department does the trails that are on city property. Uh, if we have a connector trail, they do that too. But most of these trails that you see on, on main roads adjacent to residential areas, we do leave them up to the property owners to remove snow and ice from that. Uh, Just throwing that out there if that's <clears throat> something we want to change, but uh, that's how we handle it currently. Do we have a lot of complaints? Oh. Uh, from either users or property both, owners? Both, yes. I mean, we, and rightfully so, some of the property owners say, why do you do some trails? Why do you not do the trail in front of my house? It's a tough, it's a tough thing to argue. Um, and, and also, yeah, I mean, as time goes along, more and more people are using these trails during the winter. Um, you know, whether, whether that be, you know, just cold weather clothing is so good now, I don't know, but yes. We get a lot of complaints on both sides of these, so. And, but these aren't like these property owners' sidewalks. Like they'll probably have a sidewalk in the front of their property and so forth. So this is additional pavement compared to a sidewalk in their house. Some of them, yes. Yep. Some of them will have a sidewalk on three sides of their house, two sides of their house plus this trail. Yeah. I mean, that's a, how, how would you expect the person that has this whole ditch or green area to access the, this, to move the snow. Yeah, and, and, and that's when, when, so when a resident calls in <laughs> asking me the same thing, it's a tough question to answer. Um, you know, our ordinance says that the sidewalk is defined, you know, as there is the pavement between the uh, property line and the curb line, and they are responsible for snow removal on it. So, you know, we, we, we basically just go back to the ordinance right or wrong, and I guess that's what we're kind of Sounds asking. like we need to maybe have a conversation about clarifying. Well, we, as we get to wider ones, maybe we do need to revisit the policy. So. I mean, are we writing tickets if somebody doesn't, I mean, I guess it's one thing that the ordinance says they have to do it, but are we actively enforcing the ordinance and going after the people who, who maybe are not coming to push the snow off of this? Yeah, what we'll do is our department will deliver notices if they fail to comply with those we, we deliver notices if they fail to comply, we'll do the work at their expense. And, uh, well, and it's one of those, I mean, there's a lot of trails in our neighborhood that aren't cleared and people end up wearing yak tracks or, you know, walking lightly. I mean, so the trail is still heavily used. It's just there isn't a responsibility to always clear it. Yeah, we, we do differentiate between a trail that's a sidewalk next to a street and just a recreational trail through a green space. And uh, those, those green space trails in general don't get any treatment. That, and that's pretty typical. Right. One thing in here, Tim, quick. Yeah. Just what we have found, though, on a lot of this, there is usually one neighbor that'll go go down the way and ends up clearing a lot with a snowblower for for the neighborhood. That's why, again, we have do some some areas we do have complaints. Other areas it just gets taken care of. It's kind of surprising. The only thing I would add is it's just something we'd have to definitely look at if we wanted to change the policy and start completely clearing them. Just keep in mind the staffing needs that are that yeah. there are because. Again, we, have, we have a hard time keeping up with, with the major snows and the trails just add 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 more work. So just want to make sure everybody keeps that in mind. Yep. We we'll definitely want that run by legal. I mean, there's all kinds of legal consequences as to who's supposed to clear the sidewalk and who isn't. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. And just real briefly, AJ asked me to comment on um, uh, our parking ordinance. I'm sure you're aware we don't have designated snow routes in Urbandale. When we put the parking, emergency no parking ban into effect, it's everywhere. And, uh, you know, it, it, is, it, is a, it is an issue. Of course, it's an issue in every community. But uh, 
you know, I think Rob was going to show up, but but he's not here, um, so I don't really have any statistics. But uh, you know, the, the police department does do an excellent job of supporting us. I don't know that they can do anything more. You know, if somebody's parked in the street, two things: it's a hazard, obviously, that snowplow operator. And second of all, we have to come back and clear that. And uh, you know, I know, they do as well as they can. Obviously, when it snows, they're pretty busy doing some other things. So. Their priority is, is not writing tickets. We do we do tow plenty of vehicles. I would guess it's in the area of 50 a year. If, if a policeman or a policewoman sees a vehicle that's been there for a couple snowstorms, it's pretty evident uh, they'll get that plowed. So I didn't know if there were any questions on that. That's just a headache of snow and ice removal that really everybody has to deal with, and there's, there's really no solution to it. All right. Any other questions? Questions for Tim? You're going to keep the snow away this year, though. I hope so. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, thank you for hanging with us and uh, some extra time today, everybody. So with that, I'll ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right.